By way of explanation, this day, um, I've been thinking about the simplest possible explanation and introduction to what this is that we are doing because of various things. Um, there have been more funerals than usual lately and some things that, uh, you know, that have seen and heard things that people, you know, intended to do things they didn't do or trusted people they shouldn't have trusted. And uh, I realized that we really need a genuine explanation of what the faith is. What is the church? Um, for people who've never heard and or never understood what this is. And so this is my attempt here at a, a very genuine explanation, but it's also, to my thinking, the simplest possible introduction to this idea. And I think there will be, you know, well, I know there's at least one more lesson behind this one, but <laughs> now there's at least uh, two more after this that we'll talk through. But I wanted to start with the overview kind of explanation and try not to assume terminology, beginning with, you know, the term church. What is the church, right? So the first thing to look at today or at this time is just to define this term, what is, what is church? You know, it, in English, it is kind of a special word. And can we understand this thing? Should we refer to a dictionary, etc.? But the larger part is to give a very concise history of the church to explain this. Where is it from? What is it for? Without further ado, let's look at the definition of the term church. Now, the truth is, the church is the gathering of people who worship God. That's what the church is. This, this is a straightforward truth about it. If you wanted to know what, what is this thing, well, this is the gathering of the people who worship God. We are here gathered. We are the people. We are gathered in order to worship God. That's the point of this thing, the reason for this gathering. That is the church, and it always has been. So that's the easiest thing, the most straightforward, truthful answer about what this is and what it's for. But I do want to look a little more closely at the term church in the English language, which we are now speaking. <laughs> because if you look it up in the dictionary, literally the first definition is a place of assembly. <laughs> and that's not correct. Well, it is correct insofar as that's usually what people mean when they say church. They're talking about a location. Uh, a, a temple or a basilica, um, something like this, the churches, like the, the churches all over Europe, these very old buildings, ornate and full of beautiful stone that nobody worships in, but they have great concerts because of the acoustics. That's usually what people mean when they say church, but that is incorrect. That's not what the word originally meant. That's what it has come to mean in popular understanding, or we should say popular misconception. The fact is that the word that the Bible uses when you read in your translation the word church is a Greek term, ecclesia, which means a public assembly. It's public insofar as we've been called out of our homes or our private uh, domicile, and uh, gathered together in one place or assembled in one place. If you're called out of your home to gather in one place, that's a public assembly is what that is. This is the word in the Bible that is translated church. It's the public assembly. So again, the church of the Bible and the church of the English language are different things. The church of the Bible is not the place where we worship 
or where people gather. In the Bible, the church is the people who have gathered to worship. That's what the church is to God. The place where we gather is incidental from the perspective of the scriptures. It could be some edifice or some building or other. It could be some rendezvous point under a tree or whatever it might be. Not to say that we're trying to be disorderly or cagey, just to say we shouldn't conflate the place where we gather and the people who are gathered. Those are not the same thing. Certainly from the perspective of the Bible, those are not the same thing. And we can also add to this that it should be clear God cares about people, not things. God doesn't care about the building the way that he cares about the people who are gathered in that building. That's the emphasis for him and what matters to him and what Jesus died for and shed his blood for is the people for us. So we ought to have the same emphasis that God does. By way of explanation, this is the term church so that we're not assuming something that is not shared understanding. It is the people who gather to worship God is the church. And as we said before, it always has been, which is how we're going to begin the greater part of the lesson, looking at this concise history of the people who've gathered to worship God. And the Bible, of course, records all of these things. It is the real history. And Genesis is the first book. Genesis, of course, being a, a word that means the beginning or the origin. So it's a good title for the first book, which tells us how everything began. That's very reasonable. The fact is that at first there was no church. There was not an assembly of people called out of their homes to come together to worship God. That didn't exist. And that didn't exist for a long time in the earliest stages of humankind on earth. What you find in the book of Genesis instead is that God dealt directly with individuals. As a rule, we're talking about heads of household. But God dealt directly with individuals, giving them what it was he wanted or expected from them and giving them whatever corrections were necessary. That's the way it was at first on earth. And it starts in the creation when God creates Adam. And he creates Eve too. But at that time, he spoke directly to Adam about things that were required, about the fruit of the garden that he was allowed to eat and the fruit he was not allowed to eat, which information he shared dutifully with Eve. And you find that their sons, Cain and Abel, are recorded in Genesis 4, and you have God speaking directly for example, with Cain in verse 6 of Genesis 4. Why are you angry, said the Lord to Cain? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God very kindly and patiently teaching, reaching out to individuals. You find in the fifth chapter, sometime later, Generations later comes a man named Enoch, who's recorded there in Genesis 5, say 21 through 24, the verses 21 through 24, where we learn that he walked with God. 300 years, had sons and daughters, but he walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. God dealt directly with this one who walked with him. And this is a contrast to what was going on around him. Most people weren't doing that. Until you get down to Genesis 6, where we see Noah, and this is the account of what happens with Noah, and how he found favor with God in verse 8 of Genesis 6, even though 
at that point in time, Genesis 6, verse 5 records, the Lord saw the wickedness of man, humanity that is, was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So this is unfortunate, but Noah found favor, and God spoke to Noah directly, telling him what he wanted. So that's the way things were. But time passes, and there comes a time when there is a man named Abram to whom God speaks directly as he had spoken to all the others, who believes God, and God renames him Abraham. What's happening here is God is modeling what his people will be like, his assembly, those who will gather to worship him, what's that going to be like? Where's that going to come from? Well, he models this through this man, Abraham. It is Abraham who becomes the great-grandfather, actually, (laughs) of the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of people who are Abraham's descendants. They are the first ones in the Bible who are called the congregation of God's people, the gathering of the people who worship God. They're the first ones who are called this way in Scripture. So this is where he's going. He started at first talking directly with those whom he had made and those with whom he had dealings, Eventually, there comes a point where he begins to model a gathering of people to worship. And a less direct messaging through a prophet. In this case, it's going to be Moses. But he starts with Abraham and tells him quite a few things, which we will, in fact, read here in Genesis 12. He starts with Abraham because Abraham actually believes God. At a time when most people didn't. And this is in Genesis chapter 12. It's the first three verses, but this is God speaking to him while his name is still Abram. He hasn't been renamed yet. But these are the promises that he makes him. The Lord said to him, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you will become a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse the one who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. These are the promises that God made to Abram or to Abraham, and we can summarize them as three basic things. The first being, I'm going to show you a land instead of your homeland. He called him to leave his father's house and his relatives to go to a place that God was going to show him, a place he had not seen. He said, I will make of you a great nation. And he said, in you all families of earth will be blessed. This is a time, in Genesis 12, when Abram has no children. And he still lives in his homeland. And God says to him, you leave this place. And he's already happily married, but he and his wife cannot have children. But God tells him, you leave this place. I will make a great nation from you. And you will be the blessing for all the families of earth, not just those descended from him, but every family. When when God said this to Abram, Abram believed him. He got up and he left and went where God told him to go. The nation that God promised, as we mentioned briefly, is what we call Israel. Israel is just an alternate name for Jacob, who is Abraham's grandson. 
And Israel, or Jacob, has 12 sons, if you will. His 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. That's all that we mean. Tribes are uh, leaves, if you will, or branches. So they're making a comparison to a tree, a family tree. These are the, the branches off of the root that is Abraham, grandfather, you know, or great-grandfather, Isaac, grandfather, Jacob, father, these 12 sons. These are the first ones to be called the congregation of the people of God. That's what's happening. The land that God promised him was the land we call Canaan. He said this was the place he would give to him and to his descendants, the nation of Israel. The fact is, there were people living there, it's true. The Canaanites were living there, but they were displaced. God displaced them because of the terrible things that they were doing. There are very, hmm, yeah, there are very horrifying things that they did in worship to the god Molech, for example, which you can look up. But it's not the only thing. It was a very bad thing that was happening there. So he gave that land, God did, to the nation of Israel to possess instead. Now the third promise, that in you all families of earth will be blessed, that God made to Abraham. That's where things get interesting. Because <laughs> at this point in time, we're talking about one nation, the nation of Israel. And it's true God deals with the one nation of Israel for quite some time. Sending Moses after they've spent 400 years in Egypt, bringing them out, taking the land of Canaan, seeing them through prophets and judges and kings and captivity and return and many different things that happened to this nation as happened to any nation that's around for any period of time. But where do all families of earth come in? The fact is the land of Canaan that God gave to them and the definition of the nation of Israel, the descendants reckoned through Isaac and Jacob or Israel and his 12 sons, they're limited in the same way that any land and any nation is limited. They, you know, lands have borders. Uh, nations have a lineage. And everything is subject to time frames. <laughs> They say time heals all wounds, and time also heals, or time also wounds all heals. <laughs> but borders, lineage, time, these things limit a nation, these things limit a land. And those promises had those limits imposed upon them. It's true, but there's another promise, a blessing to all families of earth. That isn't bound by a single land. That's not bound by a single lineage. It's not even bound by a specific time. That promise comes to anybody who believes in God the same way that Abraham believed in God. God said to him, this is what I'm going to do. And it seemed impossible or at least unlikely, <laughs> that didn't matter. He believed God anyway. Because why should we think that God's power is limited? Why should we think he can't make a nation out of a husband and wife who are unable to have children? Well, he can do that. He did. Why should we think he can't save the congregation of those who worship him from their slavery in Egypt. Well, we shouldn't think that. He certainly can, and he did. 
We ought to believe God the same way that Abraham believed God. And when we are doing this, we're like Abraham. And this is the meaning of that promised blessing. I think one of the best <laughs> summaries of this is found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter, the apostle, makes his way into the household of a Roman. This occasion in, Acts, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. This occasion is the first time that a citizen of the nation of Israel, limited as it is by lineage and borders and time, a citizen of that nation, Peter, is now going to somebody who has nothing to do with that nation, who is rather a member of the set of all families on earth, Romans. These are the first Romans, or the first people who are not Israelites to hear this. And it's the time at which it dawns on the Israelites that there is another shoe to drop. The faith, the blessing promised to Abraham, to all nations, still has to come. And that's why I think Peter's words are the best summary in Acts 10, it's 34 to 35, when he said to this household of Romans, In truth, I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. There's not a better summary, I don't think. When God made the promise that there would be a nation and that there would be a land, he was not showing partiality. He was modeling the people and the things that he would do for the people. No, he doesn't show partiality. In fact, in every nation, anybody who fears him, anybody who does what is right, finds acceptance with him. You may recall what we read earlier, kind of quickly, I admit, but we read earlier in Genesis 4 how God reasoned with Cain, if you do right, won't you be accepted? If you do wrong, sin is at the door knocking for you, but you must be its master. The same God is making the same plea today for all of us. He shows no partiality. If we fear him and we do what is right, we will find acceptance with him. If you do right, won't you be accepted? Yes, that is the God whom we serve. And he promised Abraham that in him all the nations, all families of earth would be blessed. So this is really what's happening. The church, which is the gathering of the people who worship God, that congregation, that people, that, that yeah, I guess, yeah, that spiritual nation, the church, is just following in Abraham's footsteps in the sense that everybody today is believing in God and obeying God the way that Abraham believed God and obeyed God. This is something that the Apostle Paul explains in his letter to Galatia, Galatians chapter 3. He's explaining this to them because there were people in Galatia who did not understand the purpose of the nation and place of Israel. But this is the meaning, ultimately, Let me grab Galatians 3, beginning at verse 6, actually. 
just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted righteousness, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing God would justify the nations by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand when it said, In you all the nations shall be blessed, or all families of earth. So then it is those who are of faith, that is, who have that same faith in God that Abraham did, who are blessed alongside believing Abraham. If you are a believing person, you are like Abraham, who was a believing person. God promised that in him all nations would be blessed. God considered him righteous when he believed these promises. And it is those who are of faith who are his sons. The scripture knew that God would justify all the nations in this way, and that's why it made that promise. It's the meaning of that promise, and it always was. What are Abraham's steps? Well, he trusted in God when God told him something that seemed contrary to fact. When he was told to leave his homeland, he did, for something he did not know, something he had not seen. And when he was tested by God, he went through with it. Even when it hurts, he still did it. When we say he trusted in God, Hebrews tells us, the letter to the Hebrews tells us in the 11th chapter and 10th verse that Abraham was looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. He trusted God like that. If God said, you come out of there, I'm going to show you something better, he believed him. He looked forward to that. He trusted him. Leave your homeland. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going, Hebrews 11, verse 8 says. And Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac, his own son, he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it had been said through Isaac, your seed will be reckoned. This is the lineage. He considered, or rather he reckoned, that God was able even to raise him from the dead. That was no problem. If he thought perhaps that Isaac would die, well, that's no problem. God will just raise him from the dead because he already promised that he would make a nation out of me, and he's not going to break that promise. That's Abraham's mind. That is faith. That's what faith is. These are Abraham's steps, and this is what we are walking in today. We trust in that God the same way, the things that he tells us, the things that the Scripture says. You believe those things. And it means leaving your homeland. It means leaving what, you know, as Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. We have to be willing to put God first. Leave your homeland. Go to a place that I will show you, says the Lord. That place is the church, the congregation of his people. Obey God even when it hurts. Abraham did it. We must do it too. Some of the things that God calls on us to do are not comfortable things. Sometimes people do not appreciate things that God commands. Do not appreciate the way that God sees things, and there will be trouble. But we stay faithful to our God even in those times of trouble. If we are living in this way, then we are living the way that Abraham lived. And if we are living that way, finishes out Galatians 3, then we are, in fact, making him our father according to faith. In Galatians 3, it's 26 through 29, I'd like to read it. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have put Christ on. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are the offspring of Abraham. And you are the heirs according to the promise. The promise that in him all families of earth would be blessed. If you believe in God, if you are willing to leave your old ways, change your heart, repent, to live the life of God, to obey his commandments from now on, then as we have read, it's time for you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. If you belong to Christ in this way, you're, you are believing God in things that cannot be seen. You're obeying God, do, leaving behind the old way of life and entering a new life in Christ Jesus. And in this way, you become an heir of the promise that God made to Abraham. That is what the church is. It's all the people who have done this. Do you believe in God today? Do you believe the things that he has written in his word? Then you should become Christ. Put to death the old person of sin that you are by being buried with him in baptism and be resurrected by the power of God in the Spirit, coming up from the water of baptism, a new creature created in Christ, a new person, a new beginning. God will add you to the number of his people and we'll, you know, we'll continue to worship together and you continue to grow in your faith and in your knowledge. We'll try to help and encourage you as well as, of course, take great encouragement from you. There's water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus before it is too late. We mentioned earlier the limitations of any nation and of any people. There's borders and boundaries. There's lineage. There's time. We all think that we have time, and we always think that we have time. But you know, <laughs> there's coming a time when, no, you don't. You don't have time. And it's never like you think it is. The time to obey God is today. Today is the day of salvation. Do not delay to do what you know is right and what God is calling upon you to do. The Christian life is the right life, the best life. Your conscience is clean because you're being completely honest with yourself and with God. And you know that God has you, whatever might happen in this world. And you have us, your brethren. We'll do the best we can to stay there by your side. I will let you down because I'm not perfect. But I'll do the best that I can. I'll make a good faith effort. And I know that these good people will too. Today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian. Put him on in baptism. If you are a Christian, but you haven't lived right, repent and pray God for forgiveness, as is recorded for us in Acts 8. But let the church pray for you too, because none of us is beyond temptation. None of us has reached this place of perfection where we no longer need the blood of Jesus. Let us build one another up in prayer and encouragement. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, please let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front now while we stand and sing the song selected. Won't you come?